Welcome back, everyone. May I have your attention? Uh, we're going to start now with our third session of the day, uh, a session on valuing the ancient water cultures, an inspiring source of innovation for sustainable groundwater management. And I have the pleasure of inviting Mr. Alberto Eulisse, who will be the moderator of this session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants and guests, I have the pleasure to introduce this side event. My name is Roberto Ulisse, director of the Global Network of Water Museums, which is a flagship initiative of uh, the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program of UNESCO. So the goal of this side event organized by WAMUNET, the acronym of the Global Network of Water Museums, is to discuss how historical practices of groundwater management and related heritage based on local and indigenous knowledge systems can inspire still today institutions and policy makers to build just and sustainable features. The side event is linked to a parallel exhibition with the same title, Valuing Ancient Water Cultures, which is close to the main entrance that you can visit. Uh, the exhibition illustrates eight paradigmatic case studies of historical groundwater management from different parts of the world, from India to Oman, to Italy and the Mediterranean basin, Morocco, Algeria, Chile, and Mexico. Both the side event and the exhibition are organized by WAMUNET in cooperation with the nine institutional partners. And I invite you to pick up a, a brochure to know more about uh, the partners and also the eight case studies. The brochures are available here. So the two overarching questions that uh, now will be discussed by eight distinguished speakers are, first, can historical groundwater management structures, systems and practices contribute to inspire policymakers and institutions to address future resilience planning and better adaptation in order to face the challenges of climate change and growing water scarcity? Concerning the second question, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Eddie Morse, who is director of IHE Delft, and also president of the Global Network of Water Museums, who will provide some initial uh, statements to the following question, the second question. What is the role and the contribution of water museums to make the invisible visible and build novel approaches on water awareness education for more forward-looking water uses targeted by the UN SDGs? Please, Professor Eddie Morse, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Eriberto, and um, I'm uh, quite uh, pleased that uh, I have the possibility to uh, say a few words uh, to you on uh, something that uh, I think is, is uh, dear uh, to everybody, uh, and that's water. Uh, so uh, why uh, do we uh, want to have water museums? Uh, one reason uh, I think that's quite important is that uh, we think that a part of the new younger generation may have lost uh, some of the, the values that uh, that water has. And we think it's very important uh, that we try to create a new bond uh, between uh, this new generation uh, with uh, water. And we think we can help doing that uh, through the water museums. What I also would like to stress is that uh, when we use the word museums here, it's not only the traditional uh, museums that you all know, but it's also about uh, other sorts of museums. So it's about pop-up museums, it's about eco-museums, uh, it's about communities, and uh, all that we would like to use uh, to create this value for our young generation. But I uh, just want to give you a few numbers of what, what WAMINET is at the moment. At the moment, there are more than 80 members um, with, with WAMINET spread over 33 countries. 
And uh, we have uh, also about uh, 30 million visitors uh, on a yearly basis. So it's a, it's a quite large uh, group of people that come to those uh, museums. And uh, we think that that also gives an, an opportunity. That also maybe uh, explains a little bit why uh, UNESCO is interested to have uh, WAMUNET, so the Water Museum Network, as one of their flagship projects. And that is uh, because of uh, this, this uh, large and maybe a little bit unusual um, target group, which is uh, the young uh, generation coming from a science program, like the intergovernmental hydrology program is. The other reason is that uh, the water museums, uh, they are looking backwards, uh, they're, they're looking at traditions, but also very much looking forward. Uh, so all uh, the members of those museums are also interested to see what we can learn from the past and what we uh, can apply to the future to solve, for example, issues like climate change, but also the population increase that we have. And uh, what we think is that um, we have lost maybe some of the traditional ways uh, that were quite a nice way of handling water. Of course, you need some adjustments because uh, the world has changed, but we do think that that can be used. Again, uh, to stress a bit what um, the museum does, so it's about education. So a lot of the partners that we have in there, uh, they will uh, try to train uh, young people or make create awareness. Uh, one of the things that we're doing, uh, that is about the youth contest that we have. That's the water we want, as you can see on the slide over here. This is a contest where um, youngsters are invited actually to express uh, how they think about water, but also the water they would like to have. Uh, we have different age classes and different ways how that can be done. So that's one way how we participate with uh, the global network. A second important one is the, um, the global uh, digital exhibition that we have, that is I Remember Water. Um, that was especially uh, coming up uh, during COVID time when it was uh, quite difficult for museums to have visitors there. So at that moment in time, uh, we uh, created uh, this uh, nice uh, exhibition that um, gives the opportunity for people to also from home or in other situation, to see why water is uh, so important. So I invite you also to have a look there. I think it's uh, a quite interesting part. But um, another exhibition that we have is Valuing Ancient uh, Water Cultures. And uh, again, uh, this is one where we collaborate as a network uh, together. And of course, uh, there is the exhibition that will be opened uh, tomorrow. But uh, you, if you're really interested, you can already have a look at the exhibition because it's uh, actually when you enter the main entrance of the building here, you can have a look at those uh, different, uh, 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 I think, information states with quite nice pictures. And uh, like Iribeto already announced, it's about the, the groundwater system, the invisible water. Uh, the water museums, they have a wider, um, ambition than only groundwater. They also would like to look at surface water. And the last part I would like to ask your attention for is that uh, at the moment there is an open uh, call uh, to participate in an inventory uh, to know in which countries uh, there are water museums. That's about the existing water museums, but as a global network, we're also quite interested to hear about new initiatives. And I'm quite happy that I already heard some people that wanted to talk to us about new initiatives to see if they could establish a water museum in their country or in their region. So in both cases, please feel free to contact us. Roberto here is uh, the main contact point of the Water Museum Network, but there are other members here also in, uh, in the room. Maybe I should just ask uh, who's a member of uh, the Water Museum Network. Maybe they can just raise their hand so people can also see. I see, Alexander, you should raise your hand there as well. But <laughs> So just in case that you have questions, then please feel free to approach them. And uh, I hope that uh, together we're able to create this, this value, this value for our new generation about why water is so important. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you so much, Professor Eddie Morse. I'm now pleased to introduce uh, the second speaker. We have uh, two overview presentations. Uh, the first one uh, will be made by Elisabeth Lichtevoet, you know already, I think, uh, Elisabeth, uh, director of uh, IGRAC, uh, um, 
So the main question that I would like to answer concerning the first two overview presentations is uh, the following. Can insights from local and indigenous knowledge systems contribute solving today's water challenges? Please, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much, Heriberto. Uh, very honored and to have been invited to this uh, side event and to be here. Um, so I have a few slides. Um, maybe you can go to the first one, uh, the next one. Y yes, uh, this is this one. Yeah. It's changing, okay. <laughs> so, uh, worldwide, uh, we find vestiges of structures developed by past uh, civilization and culture to meet their water needs. Next one, please. In arid and semi-arid areas, and in regions also uh, historically affected by uh, adverse events, uh, prolonged droughts, uh, floods, like the, Medi the Mediterranean region, North Africa, Middle East, uh, Central Asia, India, China, the Andean Cordillera. There we can find vestiges of groundwater use and management. So we can divide, next slide speed, we can divide uh, those vestiges in three types, uh, three big types of structures. The first one, um, uh, is are the structures used to sow water uh, by implementing systems with systems which facilitates groundwater recharge. The second type are structures uh, used to retain water by improving infiltration, drainage, and uh, using the, the capacity of natural reservoirs like wetlands. And the third ones are structures used to collect water by developing uh, systems uh, for, uh, for extracting, for extraction of groundwater. And for example, uh, hundred wells or deep hundred wells, and uh, like the underground filtration galleries, most known as Canat, Cares, Ketara, Fogara, Socavones, they have different names, Viajes de Agua, they have different names all over the world. Those structures are considered um, as one of the oldest and biggest uh, achievement of human engineering. So, but today, uh, most of those structures are abandoned, or many of them, uh, to the benefit of pump, well, and drill boreholes. So, and other modern technology. At best, they are preserved and maintained as human heritage uh, for uh, cultural and touristic use. But even if they are uh, preserved, the knowledge behind the realization of those structures is disappearing from memories, eh? if, if, uh, if not already disappeared. So it is disappearing, this knowledge is disappearing from the memories of the people and especially from the memory of the people who most desperately would need this knowledge to uh, survive in uh, our environments affected by droughts, floods, etc. instead sometimes of waiting hopelessly for external support. And this is, I think, one uh, cr critical and, uh, question uh, and challenge for the Water Museum Network. Uh, so reviving this knowledge uh, behind the implementation of those structures in, uh, is, is part of the solution in some areas um, and in some regions, but in many regions, realistically, in many regions where widespread use of pumped boreholes and wells is being made for intensive groundwater use, those structures are not able today to meet uh, the water demands. And um, so, um, why? L let's look, um, uh, next one. Yes. Um, let's look at the, and the, the filtration galleries, eh? which is a system developed uh, between 800 and 600 BC in the, uh, no, before you, yeah. <laughs> 
uh, in the ancient Persia uh, and then spread to other parts of the world and to other cultures. This system is based on passive tapping of groundwater. This means that the natural supply of water in a ground in a filtration gallery can never exceed the groundwater recharge. This is the, the this is the, the the definition of sustainable groundwater use. But today, uh, those structures are abandoned because we need more than what nature can give us. But ancestral and local knowledge is not all about realizing uh, impressive structures. And they, I would just would like to speak about Andean culture and Andean communities, which have been uh, pre-Columbian culture and communities have developed ingenious adaptive solution for um, uh, to 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 uh, balance uh, the an irregular supply with um, um, with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, affected by drought and, and and floods with their uh, demand and uh, uh, as all or, other cultures around the world they uh, have an inte integrated and holistic um, uh, understanding of the water cycle and even beyond and uh, that cost us too much today uh, because the water cycle connect the earth and the atmosphere. And uh, for those communities, uh, all the elements, uh, even human beings, constitute a unity. And uh, in order to maintain this unity, you need to maintain dialogue between all these elements. And the central, uh, and in order to maintain this dialogue, the central concept is uh, uh, reciprocity. And reciprocity means that a, a, if I want nature to be good at me and to uh, provide me all what I need, I need to be good at nature. If I fail in this duty, uh, uh, all kind of disaster and catastrophe will happen. So uh, they have developed this uh, uh, unique and cultural concept of the obligation of humans to preserve and maintain nature. And uh, this is this summarizes the cosmo cosmovision of the Indian community. But and this is maybe one of the most ecological thinking ever uh, developed. But in culture today, no? So today we have the same challenges. We have an ever increasing irregular supply of water affected by drought, floods, and we have a very high demand. So we can uh, be inspired by uh, those uh, the ingenious adaptive solution uh, developed by those uh, culture, and this is what we receive uh, uh, now. But Will we be able uh, to integrate reciprocity uh, to avoid the tragedy of the commons? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for highlighting this important concept about uh, reciprocity. And I'm pleased now to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, Professor Jordi Morato Ferreras hmm. from the Technical University of uh, Barcelona. I will ask the same questions about. Uh, uh, ancestral hydro technologies, how they can support institutions to better adapt to climate change. Please, Jordi, the floor is okay. yours. Bonjour, uh, good morning. Uh, you can put this, the slide presentation. Uh, we want to focus our talk about the, the ancestral hydro technologies uh, for climate adap uh, adaptation for cl climate emergency. You know? Next slide, please. Uh, the first question, if we can learn from the past, uh, in order to adapt to our future. Uh, in that sense, uh, human beings have been uh, able, obviously, uh, uh, able to, to adapt to extreme conditions. No? In any location, uh, populations have developed during centuries uh, uh, socio-ecological and technical and cultural systems the, that are basic uh, for their adaptation. No? Uh, today, we it's uh, really basic to understand that uh, knowledge, mainly based in the intangible cultural heritage linked to water, linked to habitat, uh, if we want to improve uh, climate adaptation. Next slide, please. Uh, in that sense, uh, we can define a vulnerability for any place uh, as a component of 
two, two issues, uh, a biophysical vulnerability uh, defined by the geographic context, but more important, the social vulnerability that is defined by uh, the social firing, no? the, the experience, the perception of communities during centuries. No? Next slide, please. Uh, therefore, uh, as, and as a summary, we can find uh, a local or indigenous knowledge systems, and today we want to uh, improve that uh, that knowledge to understand in order to manage our adaptation to the to the environment. Next, please. Uh, in the Mediterranean area, it's curious to know that most of the water systems, the water supply systems, the water distribution system, and water sanitation. Uh, were developed many centuries ago, even during the Bronze Age. No, uh, many of our systems come directly from from the Egyptian water culture and the Minoan civilization. Uh, outside the Mediterranean, uh, there were really interesting developments in the Indus Valley in the same Bronze Age, and in Latin America. And we have different partners and different joint offices with Latin American countries. We have interesting systems of hydrotechnologies in the Zenu Society in Colombia or the pre-Hispanic Amunas. No? Uh, in that sense, the scientific community increased the, the interest in water heritage. And you can see on the left a figure uh, around the scientific publications uh, around the concept water heritage. Uh, and you can notice a, a significant increase during the last five years of the number of scientific papers around water heritage. No? Uh, other similar concepts that we find were hydrotechnologies, hydraulic heritage, ancestral water, or ancient water. No? Uh, next slide, please. Then we have different lessons learned from that uh, water heritage. The first lesson is that uh, we understood, these civilizations understood the importance of sanitation, of water supply and drainage. No, not just for human survival, even for human well-being. No? Uh, and even they make uh, an essential part of the urban planning to achieve water resource sustainability. No? A second lesson is that they uh, obviously recognize water quality and water security as the critical aspects. Uh, a third lesson is that they combine a smaller scale measure with uh, bigger or large scale water supply projects. And finally, they or that water technologies were really simple and easy of operation. Some examples in the next two slides uh, of that hydro technologies from uh, Latin American countries like the Amunas in Peru, uh, raining harvesting in the upper part of the Andes. Uh, they inject in some rocks uh, and they uh, collect uh, that water many months uh, later and many meters below and you can see the comparison without the the in the water flow uh without uh harvesting these systems and uh with that system next slide is uh, another example the uh the zenu uh, system in colombia where uh is a really multifunctional uh system for flowing control water security and food security next slide please you you can see that uh, system. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. one minute, no, five minutes. <laughs> four. Okay, four. No problem. <laughs> then, <laughs> then they, they, the Zenu system were really interesting because we uh, were developed four hundred years before Chris, uh, and you can see that the, today the scientists uh, are working a lot in the quadruple nexus and the water energy food and ecosystem nexus. And this is a, an incredible example of the of that quadruple nexus, no? Because they can uh, maintain uh, the agriculture in the rainy season, uh, not please, <laughs> the, below, uh, and then uh, during the flooding season, uh, and they can maintain the, the, the agriculture during the dry season. Uh, Today, we can replicate that ancestral hydrotechnologies. We can have different examples of that system. Uh, today, people lost that knowledge. And during the rainy season, all the soil is flooded. And during the dry season, all is dry. And next slide, please. 
uh, we, we have examples of, of replication and in Colombia, in the next slide, we have an example of a uh, really beautiful replication of an uh, of an that still uh, model of the Zenu system and more uh, 100 families live in with agroecology in that system. Finally, uh, in the next slide, uh, today there's a new trend about nature-based solutions uh, and obviously there's uh, in the next slide, please. Uh, there's a, a direct connection with the traditional ecological knowledge, that community body of multi-generational knowledge with nature-based solutions. As a final remark in the last slide, uh, well, in, uh, we can uh, have different issues uh, and different fields of research uh, today related to that traditional ecological knowledge, to, to, to that uh, uh, sets uh that uh that are for example equidrology you can the next slide please okay uh bioengineering uh feed the technologies uh there is there is a new trend to use solutions based in nature no uh solutions that are obviously that we want uh to design to address that societal challenges uh in a resource uh, efficient and adaptive manner and we want to design in order to uh, achieve not just environmental benefits uh, also economic and social benefit no? you can see even the elephants know that filter water is safer than uh, drink directly from the river no? then uh finally and last slide uh next slide please uh there's a really uh um a, a bus need uh, of uh of of that sustainable and cost effective water supply water sanitation water drainage facilities and there are several of that answers of hydro technologies that could be considered not just as historical uh artifacts but also uh, potential models for sustainable water technologies for our uh, adaptation and uh, you are invited to our uh, international conference uh, that we organize uh, in close collaboration with Oamonet and, and, and other partners uh, next February in Barcelona. All of you are invited uh, in order to discuss that ancestral hydrotechnologies as a response to climate, health, and food emergency focus in the Mediterranean area. No? All, all the details in our web page. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Morato Ferreras. Uh, so thank you for illustrating um, uh, additional concepts, uh, key concepts, uh, uh, not only reciprocity, but uh, nature-based solutions, uh, how this uh, historical uh, groundwater heritage can uh, still be used and inspire institutions to provide uh, new solutions. So now we move to the final part of our uh, session. And uh, we have uh, four additional speakers. Um, that are going to illustrate specific case studies. Three of them are also included in the exhibition. One from uh, Venice, Italy, uh, from India, from Algeria. And uh, I hope that uh, our online speaker, Sara Hamed from India, can hear me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hello, Sarah. I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. So uh, Sara Hamed is the director of the Living Waters Museum from Pune, India. Uh, I would like to ask Sara in five minutes to illustrate a bit. Uh, well, five minutes is, is not easy, eh? but uh, uh, <laughs> the outstanding heritage of Indian sacred step wells, not only their history and function, but to try to focus also um, considering the worrying state of abandonment what are the opportunities for revival and rehabilitation and how this heritage can illustrate novel concept for water cooperation. Please, Sara, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Herberto. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. So the thank first you. slide. You can, yes. The first slide. So there are many, there are more than 3,000 step wells that uh, dot the semi-arid landscape of Western India right up to Central Asia along the trade route. And these step wells are, I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen step wells in India, but these are amazing underground structures that mark 
the invisible landscape of groundwater. And basically they could be anything from um, 60 to 80 feet deep. And the, whilst they're based on an aquifer source, they're also recharged by ground, by rainwater through a process of seepage. These step wells, when they were built, they were built by wealthy people, uh, kings and queens and merchants uh, who wanted to do a meritorious act because water is a gift in India. It's the gift of water. Uh, unfortunately, and as one of the speakers mentioned earlier, with the introduction of piped water systems under colonial and post-colonial rule in India, step wells were uh, disregarded. No one really went to them. In the 1980s, there was a big campaign around guinea worms and, you know, when women going down to draw water from the step wells were being affected by guinea worms. So, and, and now many of these abandoned step wells um, have been converted into community halls, some into temples and so on. Next slide, please. So what do we do? We're a virtual museum and uh, we know that there are many beautiful books out there on the step wells in India, but a lot of people don't even know that there is a step well in their backyard virtually. So we're trying to uh, bring this out. We've been trying to work on an interactive map on step wells that people who use the map can, can click on and see uh, the, the stories behind different step wells. We've been using uh, technology to map uh, digital heritage like pho photogrammetry and uh, also creating storybooks for children. So this is a book that tells a story about a little girl in a futuristic world where there's no water and she, she falls down a step well, much as Alice in Wonderland fell down a uh, um, um, tunnel and she's looking for water and she finds that all these taps, which you see in the picture, are inverted and they're actually uh, drawing water up from these aquifers for urbanization and urban development and so on. So the story touches upon rural urban water conflicts. It talks about water values. It talks about women's role in, in, in fetching water. And finally, this girl has to negotiate her way back um, through the help of uh, uh, spiritual uh, inter inter interfaces, if you like, um, or oracles. Next slide. So, Erebeto, you asked me about uh, the role of communities and partnerships. So, in 2019, the Water Ministry in India, the Jal Shakti Ministry, real re realized the importance of what have now become our secondary water systems and launched a mission called Jal Jeevan, Water and Life. And basically the idea was to uh, use funding from the government, but also from other uh, sources to re re revive some of these ancient structures so that uh, people could understand, you know, where their water came from as well. But also these became reflective pieces. So the picture that you see uh, on the slide is from Jodhpur in Rajasthan. It's a step well called Chudhi uh, Kijara. And around the step well, unfortunately, you don't see that in this picture, but um, there are many cafes and restaurants and shops and all. So this was a multi stakeholder partnership that involved um, commercial interests, obviously, because they wanted to create a beautiful place. And in the evenings, the place is full of young people who come and just sit on the steps and you know think about water and so forth. Uh, we also have examples from community-based NGOs in India that have also worked with smaller step wells, not these beautiful structures, but smaller step wells in, in, in semi-arid landscapes like Kutch and try to re re revive them to provide um, water security for communities. And I know in one case, there were 400 uh, families who were getting water from a pipe from the pipeline system once in 10 days. And one minute left, Sarah. Thank yeah, you. I'm, I'm done. Through reviving the, the these the smaller step wells, they were able to provide water security. Um, you know, also water for livestock, water for small enterprises. And many of these structures are now being managed by community groups, including um, women. 
So I just wanted to end by saying that, uh, yes, there is a lot of work happening in India, but you can only work with step wells where there is an active aquifer, you know. So I think that's all I have to say, Herbeto. Thank you so much, Sarah. Sara Mehta is also Vice President of the Global Network of Water Museums, very active, uh, one of the two water museums from India, which are part of our network. So we get uh, closer to Paris and we move to Venice. And I'm pleased to introduce now Professor David Gentilcore, uh, which is the principal investigator of uh, the ERC project, the Water Cultures of Italy, at the Venice University of Ca' Foscari. So in the case of Venice, we don't have a similar heritage in a state of uh, comparable disrepair, but it's a kind of hidden heritage, not always so visible in the city that can have also new functions for the future, kind of second life. And this uh, concerns not only Venice, but also other examples in the Mediterranean. Please, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Heriberto, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, could I have the next slide, please? I don't know how many of you have been to Venice, but it gets about five and a half million tourists every year. And many of them will admire these uh, lovely wellheads that you can find in almost every square and private uh, courtyard throughout the city. Um, but probably without realizing uh, that, or probably assuming that these are normal wells in the sense that they tap uh, groundwater. But in fact, uh, they're uh, quite elaborate systems for capturing rainwater, for filtering it, and for storing it. Uh, next slide, please. And obviously, you'll know as well as well as I that that rainwater harvesting was absolutely vital throughout large areas. Uh, of the Mediterranean, where for climate and, and geography, there were severe limits on uh, sources of fresh water. The technology was ancient. Uh, many areas was used well into the, the 19th, the 20th century, perhaps even, even now. Um, in Europe, at least, it, it was used uh, throughout uh, up until the 19th century in, in religious uh, settings like this, this monastery here in southern Italy, uh, in rural areas, rural communities and fortresses or military settings where they needed to be independent, um, but also in areas like islands in the Mediterranean where they have no other rivers or sources of, of fresh water. Uh, and this is the case of Venice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, located, as, as you know, in, in the midst of a saltwater lagoon uh, and crisscrossed by saltwater canals. Um, so Venice wasn't unique in uh, relying on r underground uh, rainwater systems, but with a population historically of over 150,000, its approach was so systematic and widespread, the city so populous, uh, and the t technology uh, so sophisticated. I mean, nowhere was it uh, so sophisticated and, and managed so carefully as in Venice historically. Uh, so that, as you see in this map, by the 19th century, there were over 6,000 rainwater uh, cisterns in the city, public and private. So pretty much whenever you're walking on solid ground, you're walking over a rainwater cistern. So the whole built environment becomes or exists to service uh, the, the collection of uh, rainwater. Um, so the squares, the paved areas, the squares, the streets, but also the rooftops of buildings. Uh, next slide, please. Here, I just put up a slide to give you an idea how an individual cistern would look like, how it would work in the sense that the whole surface area of the square slopes down so it can collect and capture the rainwater as it falls. They're actually quite large structures occupying the whole uh, width and breadth of, of the square down to a depth of uh, three or four uh, meters below the normal high tide uh, level. 
uh, and there are holes in the paving carefully dispersed to allow the rainwater to uh, go through and then it gets filtered through a, a layer of, of sand um, and then deposits in the well shaft immediately underneath the well head so it, it allows uh, people to access it. And, and the water that they contained was managed as a public good. It was meant as a public service managed by the Venetian state in the days when it was a, an independent republic by the state on uh, behalf of the inhabitants. And it was the inhabitants of these squares who were tasked with you know, keeping them clean so that they could do their job. Next slide, please. Um, but after the construction of, of the aqueduct of the city in, in the 1880s, the cisterns slowly fell into disuse and disrepair. Rainwater, when I left Venice the other day, it was absolutely pouring. Rainwater is, is lost. It just flows directly into the canals now. Uh, occasionally, efforts are made to bring these rainwater cisterns <clears throat> back into use in specific locations and, and with specific uh, tasks, uh, you know, watering gardens or using them to flush toilets, that sort of thing. But nothing ever comes of these, these timid uh, uh, possibilities, timid attempts. So I put this last slide here to show a, a recently uh, a, res a student residence opened a couple of years ago at Kafoskari uses rainwater collected from the roofs to um, to water the gardens there, but they're around. And hopefully they say to flush some of the toilets, but <clears throat> it's really just very timid beginnings that suggest maybe some of the possibilities to recover at least part of this whole water culture that was associated with um, rainwater capture in the city. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gentilcore. I'm very grateful to all speakers to stay within the these time limits. Eh? Uh, so now we move to uh, the next speaker, uh, Farah Amamush, uh, who together with uh, Amin Saidani uh, developed uh, an interesting case study also included in our uh, exhibition. So we move now to a kind of a living waters heritage, not only something that was functioning in the past, uh, Farah Mamouche is uh, from uh, UMR, GO and CIRAD uh, branch, belonging to this institution. And so uh, we, we move now to this case study, focusing on the historical heritage of uh, groundwater in the Algerian Sahara. Today, most of uh, oases are abandoned. Nevertheless, in some cases, the ones that are still in function highlight how the concept of a circularity in particular um, can target the SDGs. So, Farah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you show me? Sorry. 
Good afternoon. So I'm going to present the case study of the Mzab Valley Oasis, so uh, which have proved uh, through time uh, to be a pragmatic model for sustainable irrigation and agriculture. So the pertinence of this oasis lies um, in the ancestral practices of uh, the circularity. So the case study is located in the Gardaia department, about 600 kilometers uh, from the capital of Algeria, Algiers. And in this region, three uh, farming models coexisted. So we have the ancient uh, oasis, including uh, those uh, the Mzab Valley. So uh, the, the irrigation communities of the Oasis people has developed a hydraulic and agricultural uh, system based on the uh, principle of the circularity for the management of the local and natural resources, including the shallow groundwater. So uh, another uh, large square uh, pioneer front, uh, Pionnier farming promoted by state and carried by uh, investors have emerged in the recent uh, decade in the Sahara. So uh, in contrast to the ancient oasis, this uh, intensive farming, it's intensive, it's intensive uh, farming. Farming is based in intensive use of uh, a little renewable water resources and uh, chemical uh, inputs. So however, uh, the Oasis people uh, aware that uh, the intensive uh, the intensive agriculture is not uh, is incompatible and compatible with uh, the specificity and characteristic of the Sahara have developed another mo another model uh, a small uh, a small scale farming outside uh, of the oasis at the periphery in the new agriculture uh, land. So uh, these farmers have drawn on the, on the circular practices and traditional knowledge inherited from the ancient oasis by, uh, while combining with the recent technologies and, um, and practices, agricultural practices to develop a more um, uh, a more uh, a healthy and a more uh, sustainable uh, agriculture, market uh, agriculture. Next. So uh, faced with the climate uh, variabilities and the low rainfall in the Sahara, less than 100 uh, millimeter per, uh, per year, the irrigation communities have developed during the 11th centuries uh, an ingenious hydraulic system that consists to capture rare and flash, uh, flash, uh, flash uh, flood water, and to divert and then to divert uh, to divert it to the to the pine grove, uh, not only to irrigate the crops but also to artificially recharge the shallow groundwater. So the water is uh, is then made uh, available during the dry period through the collective wells. So um, in addition to the collective initiative uh, for managing the aquifer, so uh, the, the principle of the circularity is the health oasis life. For example, the human and animal waste are reused uh, as an organic uh, fertilizer, miner, but also the, the agriculture waste has, uh, has uh, used, uh, has used, uh, uh, has a building, uh, has a building material. Next. Okay. So by ignoring the hydrogeological cycle and its uh, specificities, that mean where uh, where the water comes and uh, and how uh, how the water is is returned to nature. Serious environmental problem uh, have uh, have been induced by the intensive agriculture in the Sahara. So uh, it will be uh, necessary to rethink uh, the sustainable groundwater management. Um, uh, why trying to find a balance between the livelihood goal and the exploitation of uh, natural resources. 
So uh, the ancestral, uh, the ancestral water culture highlights a good practices uh, that should be promoted uh, the further to foster and more um, and more far-sighted development paradigm and face climate change. So uh, public authorities should be inspired by the ancient uh, practices and knowledge to promote a sustainable agricultural strategy in the in the Sahara. So in the our case study, um, ancestral knowledge of the circular irrigation system or the practices of the circularity and the ability of the oasis actor to, to shape a new institution and technical arrangement uh, and to adapt her production system uh, can provide a lesson uh, for more efficient and uh, beneficial use of water and uh, energy and for produce a healthy, a healthy food. So in, ad in addition, the reappropriation and the readaptation of the practices of the circularity outside oasis uh, can, uh, can contribute, uh, can represent uh, a source of aspiration for ecology sustainable and socially equitable forms. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. I invite you also to uh, watch the interesting video uh, um, that is in part of our exhibition. We now move uh, uh, to the next speaker, Monica Cardillo, uh, Maître de Conférence à l'Université de Limoges et président de l'Académie uh, de l'Eau. Please. Monica, the floor is you. Thank you, dear Roberto. Good morning to everyone. Uh, so I want to share with you uh, my reflection on three points um, about the inclusion of indigenous juridical systems to frame the concept of sustainable management of groundwater. The next slide, please. Okay. So the uh, first point on general statement about indigenous juridical systems. There are socio-political and cultural contexts where the legal regime of groundwater is multiple. Alongside the state public property, there is a sort of divine public property. Next to the state that owns and manages the aquifers, there are superior invisible entities that control these same waters and enable the local communities to have access and manage these water. To use groundwaters, people must, must obtain permission from the state service. However, those who attach a religious and divine character to these waters also perform special ceremony to pay tribute to the water genesis in order to get access to water. This ancestral system is a part of oral rights and not written rights. The next slide, please. In Sub-Saharan Africa, when groundwater is discovered by a seeker, spring digger or shaman, it's considered miraculous. This double way of managing uh, groundwaters, material on the one hand and sacred on the other, can create conflicts or uses between the national hydrological management system and local ancestral practice, and that especially in rural areas. These conflicts will be exacerbated by climate change with increasingly intense and frequent heat waves and drought. Groundwater, if protecting, also considering previous legal frameworks, is a crucial resource. Next slide, please. To avoid increasing rivaliers, and that's my second point, it is important to formally recognize the ancestral techniques of groundwater management and the existence of an intangible ancestral legal heritage. It is necessary, necessary to make visible these invisible conceptual legal framework related to water. A framework that is often hidden by the weight of history and colonialism. The next slide, please. Indeed, indigenous legal system are aiming to foster better protection and reasonable use of these valuable but limited resources 
promote farsighted and reasonable management of local waters in a context of scarcity and global climate change, and naturally contribute to the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Thus, the recognition of these ancestral legal systems would make it possible to reconcile environment concerns, the challenges of keeping peace and consolidating democracy, and respect for different forms of juridical expression other than those of the Western world. The next slide, please. So what is the role of the global network of, of, of water, water museum in supporting this process of recognition of traditional indigenous legal system? It could be to promote scientific research to acknowledge local water rights, elaborate an inventory of ancestral legal practices, and foster the development of national action plans to recognize and combine both ancient and modern knowledge as regards groundwater management. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Monica. We move to the last speaker uh, to state uh, some conclusions. Professor Francesco Vallerani, UNESCO Chair at uh, the Ca' Foscari University of Venice. Please, Francesco. Good morning. It's not very simple to close in very few minutes. Anyway, uh, at the end of this inspiring meeting, uh, I think that uh, very suggesting remarks have been emphasized. To develop a new approach in groundwater um, management, this approach is proposed by our network, Water Museum of Global, Global Network. During this side event, and thanks to the effectual presentation we have just appreciated, and to the small but full information and the well-detailed exhibition that I suggest you to visit in the main hall, um, um, this exhibition, all participants are sharing a wide range of initiatives, helping to develop a new visions and a cultural alternative to obtain a more sustainable groundwater management. Um, Water Museum Global Network is strongly promoting research on historical practices, have, as we have just uh, listened from uh, the colleagues aiming uh, at the collection and the recovery of a local and indigenous knowledge, and furthermore, to foster the awareness that groundwater is a limited resources. Um, the second here, yeah. keywords are um, change of paradigm. This is the, the keywords. As we can easily appreciate in the, the exhibited case studies, there are so many inspiring experiences based on a collective groundwater management, more respectful of underground hydrological dynamics. Developing countries and the rural societies are mostly involved in this process. Um, the next one, please. Um, in many worldwide areas, it's still possible to learn from history and from local ecological relationships between biosphere and the societies, societies, shifting from domination of nature. It's well known that ancient cultures with their balance exploitation are based on holistic expertise. All this requires a current educational approach. Finally, the last one, I know that I have to skip to the last slide, please. I, I do think that thanks to well-organized activities, water museums will be able to go on in improving the spread of traditional water knowledge with special focuses on traditional groundwater practices and finally promoting innovative approaches for future resilience planning. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you to all participants and all the speakers for these um, inspiring sessions. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have no time for questions. If you if you can address your questions, we'll answer by bilaterally by emails. I'm sorry, we don't uh, have time. Just a compliment. Compliment. C'est un compliment. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so if you are uh, interested today, we are going to make an, an official visit to the Sewage Museum of Paris, Musée des Egouts. So there is a list, you should add uh, your name if you are interested, on the main desk, the info desk, and the visit will be at five. Thank you so much. Uh, just a brief announcement, everyone. We're having a one hour break. We'll be back at 2 p.m. with more very interesting sessions. Thank you.